Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the mechanism of a genetic and fatal disease called progeria. But before we get into the mechanism of the disease, how it propagates and so forth, I want to introduce to you this man down here. This is Sam Burns, and you can see here that he lived from the years of 1996 to 2014 which would place him at approximately 18 years old. And so in this picture down here, he was around 18 or maybe a little bit less than that. And the reason that Sam Burns died so young is because he had this disease, progeria, which is an accelerated aging disease. And so individuals who suffer from progeria, at least phenotypically, they appear far older than they actually are. In fact, this is something that can be observed when they're very, very young babies they look older. Um, and in this video, we're going to talk about the mechanism of how that actually occurs. And it turns out that it's going to involve the nucleus and the structure or lack thereof of it. The mechanism of progeria is going to involve the biosynthetic pathway for mature lamin A. Okay, so lamin A is a protein that uh, gets put into the nuclear lamina of the nucleus. Recall that the nuclear lamina is a protective barrier uh, that's associated with the inner nuclear membrane of the nucleus. Okay, so this up here is an immature form of lamin A, pre-lamin A. And this is the form of it that comes directly off of the ribosome after translation. And there's a number of things I want you to notice about this immature form of lamin A. First of all, it's going to have to undergo some post-translational modifications. Um, there's actually going to be four of them that it's going to have to do, four major ones. Uh, second, over here at this end of the protein, we have four amino acid residues that are going to play a role um, in just a little bit. Those are going to be a cysteine, serine, isoleucine, and methionine. And for the cysteine residue, I've already gone ahead and drawn the thiol R group, which is going to play a role in the next reaction. And the third thing, which is extremely important, is in the middle of the protein somewhere, there's a stretch of 50 amino acids. And somewhere in there is an important sequence, R, which is arginine, serine, tyrosine, leucine, leucine, and glycine. This is just six amino acids of the 50. But this stretch of amino acids is extremely important because it's going to be recognized by an enzyme down the line. In progeria, these 50 amino acids are not present. There's a deletion event that occurs genetically and it's passed on um, from parent to offspring, and this 50 amino acid stretch is gone in progeria. We'll come back to that. But first we're gonna consider what happens for the wild type, that is people without progeria. So the first post-translational modification is gonna be a farnesyl transferase. This is an enzyme that's gonna transfer what's called a farnesyl group. It's an isoprene group, and you can see it transferred onto the cysteine over here. So it's just basically a long hydrocarbon chain, Okay, but it's called a farnesyl group. And the farnesyl group is going to play a role in localization of this protein to the nuclear lamina. Okay? Now, what's important to understand is this farnesyl group is important for the localization to the lamina, but once it's in the lamina and it's where it should be, this farnesyl group should essentially be removed. And if it's not removed, that's actually what's going to cause progeria indirectly. So that's the first reaction that has to happen, this farnesylation. Okay. The second thing that's going to happen is there's going to be an endopeptidase, which is going to cleave off the serine isoleucine methionine, this tripeptide right here. Okay? And this enzyme is given the name ZMPSTE24. I believe that's the gene name for it. But in any case, what this protease or peptidase is going to do is cleave right here between the cysteine and the serine residues. Okay? So you're going to have this SIM tripeptide float away, basically. And so now this cysteine is going to have a free carboxyl group on it. Okay, um, And so that's the action of this protease. Now this uh, carboxyl group of the cysteine, okay, this is the alpha carboxyl, is going to be methylated. That's going to occur by a methyl transferase. If we're being very specific, it's protein s isoprenyl cysteine o methyl transferase using a methyl group from SAM or s adenosyl methionine. And this carboxyl oxygen right here is going to pick up that methyl group. And you see here that methyl group has now been added onto that carboxyl. Okay, so now here's the moment of truth. Okay, we have almost what is going to become lamin A, the mature lamin A that is, um, but we have to have one more step. 
And that last step is going to involve this same endopeptidase, or potentially the same endopeptidase from up here, ZMPSTE24, but instead it's going to target a different region of the protein. And the reason it targets a different region is because now we have this uh, carboxymethyl group and the farnesyl group. It turns out that this protease right here is going to come back and target this 50 amino acid sequence. And it's actually directly going to look for this RSYLLG sequence right here, right in the middle of those 50 amino acids. Okay? And what in the wild type case is going to happen is ZMPSTE24 is going to cleave right in the middle of those, right between the Y and the L, between the tyrosine and the leucine. Okay? And it's going to effectively split this whole thing right in half. Okay, so keep in mind what I said earlier in this video. The Farnesyl group is important for localization to the nuclear lamina, just getting this protein to the lamina of the nucleus. But once it's there, this whole thing has to be removed. And it's not like the Farnesyl group is just removed, rather. Instead, half of the protein is essentially chopped off. And you can see the action of this proteus right here. This whole thing, beginning with the L and then extending all the way to the carboxymethyl group, including the Farnesyl group, this part is basically garbage, okay? This is not any part of the mature lamin A and it ought to be removed, okay? This thing over here with the RSY, which is the left part of this uh, consensus sequence right here, this whole thing is now mature lamin A. So lamin A, first of all, is a lot smaller um, than this bigger piece up here. It's a lot smaller. It's, it's a, certainly a lot smaller than pre-lamin A. Uh, but it also lacks the Farnesyl group. And as long as it lacks the Farnesyl group, it doesn't really cause any problems, okay? And this is what happens in a normal, healthy individual without progeria. Now, if we consider progeria, remember what I said the mutation was. This 50 amino acid sequence is gone, okay? Now, that doesn't affect any of these first three steps, okay? Um, if this 50 amino acid stretch is gone, it still gets Farnesylated. That ends up being the problem. This uh, SIM uh, group still gets hydrolyzed off or proteolyzed off, and you still get this carboxyl group methylated. But what you have to imagine here is, right here, this is where I have this 50 amino acid stretch. It's gone. So instead of looking like this over here, the protein instead looks like this. Now this protein, this mutant protein that is, without this 50 amino acid stretch, in other words, it has a 50 amino acid deletion, this protein is called progerin, okay? And without this 50 amino acid sequence, we certainly don't have this RSYLLG consensus. And so this protease has no place to target this protein for hydrolysis. It cannot split the protein in two. Therefore, this whole thing remains completely intact. Okay, the right side of this protein remains completely attached to the left side. We don't get mature lamin A. We get something that'll sort of look like it, except for the fact that it still has this Farnesyl group on it. And that's a problem. Because when you have this Farnesyl group, yes, it can still localize to the nuclear lamina. But unfortunately, when this gets embedded into the nuclear lamina, rather than the mature lamin A over here on the left, progerin causes structural problems and it destroys the structural integrity of the nucleus, okay? So let's go to this slide real quick, come back here. Now on the bottom half here, this is one of the most important competing hypotheses for how progeria actually is produced. So when you have this progerin getting inserted into the nuclear lamina rather than mature lamin A that we looked at on the previous slide, it causes the structure of the nucleus to become very wobbly and it just basically destroys the structural integrity of the nucleus, okay? Um, what will happen is the DNA in the nucleus normally is actually not in the center of the nucleus. When you looked at any general biology textbook or a physiology textbook, usually for simplistic points of view, they put all the DNA right in the dead center of the nucleus. But actually the DNA in the nucleus is actually associated with the membrane. It's actually associated with the nuclear lamina. And so when the nuclear lamina is mutant because you have progerin in it rather than the mature lamin A form, the DNA or the chromatin undergoes conformational stretch. And that actually, uh, first of all, uh, causes that DNA to be susceptible to damage, okay? And over time, with defective DNA repair, uh, you end up getting upregulation of this protein P53, which basically induces uh, cellular senescence and apoptosis, okay? So you have a lot of these cells dying, um, and the tissues ultimately become senescent. And overall, with this senescence, 
it causes the body overall to experience accelerated aging, and that's what causes progeria. Okay, so hopefully you found this video informative and helpful. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Again, thank you for watching.